Good afternoon and welcome to the College of Continuing and Professional Studies webinar, Navigating Conflict. Thank you so much for joining us. Next slide, please. It's a pleasure to have you all here this afternoon. My name is Shanta Pillai and I'll be your moderator for today's webinar. If you have future questions about this webinar or other programs we offer, the college's contact information will be on the last slide of this presentation. I'm delighted to introduce the topic for today's webinar, Navigating Conflict. Conflict is a normal part of everyone's life. Moreover, the way people handle conflict, anger, and criticism affects their work relationships and productivity. Many of our habitual patterns of handling conflict were developed early in life and are too limiting for the variety of situations we face today. In other words, our software could use some updating with more proactive ways to approach conflict that lead to more productive outcomes. In this web webinar, we'll start to get comfortable with the discomfort of conflict, work with instead of against our biological wiring in the midst of conflict, learn ways to diagnose the root cause of conflict, understand the stages of conflict and how to intervene, outline the seven constructive behaviors that help resolve conflict, and lastly, list the eight destructive behaviors that block creative solutions to conflict. It's a pleasure to introduce the presenter for today's webinar, Stephanie McGovern. Stephanie applies skills and techniques honed over 20 years, developing leaders, coaching, and helping create and maintain high-performing teams and leading manufacturing companies. She also has extensive experience in building employee ownership and commitment to organizational goals with, with managing a department during times of rapid change. Thank you so much for being with us today, Stephanie, and sharing your wisdom on this topic. I'll pass it over to you. All right, thank you. Well, welcome everybody. I'm so glad to have you here to talk about conflict. Um, you can just look at the news um, any, any evening and see that um, we all need to get better at handling conflict. Um, this One of the things that I think you'll find valuable is what we're going to talk about has implications for probably every aspect of your life. And, um, and I think there's just so many pieces of around conflict that maybe you are actually really good at some of this and you'll you'll kind of look at what we're talking about and you go, oh yeah, I feel pretty comfortable with that. And then you might find other areas you go, oh yeah, that's something, area that I need to look at. So um, I'm excited to explore this with you. Um, as, as maybe a little bit more background about me, um, I worked um, in group facilitation, team building, coaching, um, leadership training for many years. And about 15 years ago, um, I realized that um, I was really good at helping other people resolve conflict, but I was terrible at resolving my own conflict. And I wanted to get better at it. And I came across some work um, by e from Eckert College um, and uh, based on, um, they created something called the Conflict Dynamics Profile based on some research they did. So a lot of the concepts that you'll be seeing today is, is come from that research. And I think you'll find it really valuable in terms of just helping you come up with different ways of looking at conflict and finding kind of new entry points. So um, went through the outcomes, um, but I just wanna reiterate these a bit around really learning to lean into the edge of your discomfort around conflict, whatever that is. And also really look at some of the biological wiring that we have um, that makes it hard to deal with conflict um, as much as we might want to. And then really look at how do you find those root causes of conflict so you're not just dealing with symptoms and playing whack-a-mole. And then identifying stages of conflict and how do you intervene early um, so that you can address it when it's at its easiest stage. And then um, this is based on the, the research from uh, Eckert College, um, seven very concrete constructive behaviors we can do to resolve conflict. Um, and then eight destructive behaviors that probably nobody intends to do, but they're, off, they're very natural for us as humans and becoming more aware of when we do them and what situations we do them can be really helpful. So some of you may have heard this quote before, life begins at the edge of your comfort zone. So, so does learning. And so whatever, um, pay attention to as we're going through this today, uh, where is it that feels a little bit uncomfortable in terms of stepping into? Because I always say when you're at your learning edge, that's where the goodies are. Um, so hopefully you can find an area to explore um, from today's um, session. 
So we're going to divide it into three main chunks. Um, one is just some conflict basics to give us all a kind of a common framework. And this is really a collection of different lenses to look at conflict. So during this part, if you can think of a conflict, maybe that's current or something, a conflict you've been in in the past, um, and use this as we're looking at these different models and lenses to say, does this help me in terms of finding a path forward in this situation or could it have helped me? Um, the second part we're gonna look at is those behaviors that really help and hinder and we'll explore a little bit more of those in depth. And then we'll finish up with just three basic core skills that you're probably very aware of, but it's how do you use them more consciously in the moment in the middle of conflict? Hmm. So conflict basics. So here's some just benefits of well-managed conflict. Um, we get more at systemic root cause, um, improved relationships, um, innovation. This is one a lot of people are looking for is how do we create more innovative projects, their products, projects, um, processes, you know, all sorts of things. How do we get more innovation in just in terms of our thinking? And then, um, and then just the personal side of your own personal development, growth, and insight about you as a person. I think conflict can really help bring aware of blind spots that aren't so, always so um, fun to be aware of, but they can also help us find um, maybe bigger, broader ways of navigating and looking at things. <clears throat> so I guess our, our focus today is how can we get more of these benefits? So what is conflict? So this is based on the research from Eckert College, and um, they define it as any situation in which people have incompatible interests, goals, principles, or feelings. So I like to kind of uh, simplify that and say, it's like when all of a sudden I feel like what I want is incompatible with what you say you want. And um, there, there tends to be some sort of trigger that gets um, you know, scarcity, oh my gosh, I'm not going to get what I need here. And um, it generally creates some emotion. And that's what usually creates some of the problems with conflict is because we don't know how to navigate the emotion effectively. Um, because conflict without emotion would just probably be problem, more problem solving, which most people are pretty good at. So we're going to look at what happens to trigger that emotion and how do you um, navigate that more effectively. So just take a minute here, um, just a quick self-assessment about your own beliefs around conflict and um, just do some reflection. So how, oops, how was conflict handled in your family of origin and cultural background? Have you had more positive or negative experiences with conflict? What do you be, believe to be true about conflict? And in general, when conflict arises, what's your first reaction? So the answers to those for you personally um, are kind of the water you're swimming in around conflict. Now, some of us have had actually really good modeling around conflict. And we saw people, you know, in our family system, or we've had good bosses or people, you know, other people who have really shown us how to work through conflict well. And we've had more of those positive. Um, some of us have had just more negative experiences where it has actually turned out really badly. And it affects how we approach conflict. So we're going to look at some of those underpinnings and um, how we might do that better. So some just basic facts, most people struggle with some aspect of conflict. Some people might feel comfortable getting conflict on the table, but maybe not so com comfortable actually you know, finding ways to resolve it. Some people might be really good at resolving it, but they don't like to bring it up. Um, most people have some aspect they struggle with. Um, the research would show in general, conflict doesn't just go away if it's left alone. It just goes underground and then surfaces in different ways. Um, managing the emotional reactivity is the key to success. So we're gonna work with that. Um, 
earliest responses to conflict have the biggest impact. It's not like all of a sudden, boom, you're in conflict. There, it starts to unfold. And if we pay attention to those early signs and intervene early, it helps us before it becomes very big and, and emotional. The more we know about our response patterns, the better equipped we are to change. So being aware of your own patterns can, can help you respond. And that helps the situation in general. So um, this is a real photo. Um, so the question is, how can this be? And it looks like a rock floating in air. Oops. But um, if we flip it back upside down, what we see is we actually have a rock sitting in water. So with conflict, it's very easy to get locked in a perspective. And so one of the things we're going to look at is how do you start looking at things from different angles so that things become um, bigger, uh, there becomes more possibilities, open up more options. So my husband and I walked into a Ace Hardware in a Chinese store, um, a tiny little town one time, and um, this is what we found. It says, I'd agree with you, but then we'd both be wrong. Maybe some of you have heard of that. And we just burst out laughing because um, this is kind of that kind of polarization when you get in with somebody and you want to prove your point and you get arguing and nobody's listening to one another. And it's kind of the epitome of, you know, I call it the yabats, where we ended up just yabating each other versus listening. And nothing good comes from that. So the, this is also why we can get locked into that polarization and why our realities differ. And this is something called the ladder of inference by a man named Chris Argyris. And um, he, the, the way this goes is that it's like at the very bottom of this, we observe some data. And there's you know, thousands and thousands of bits of data, um, millions of bits of data that our brain is processing you know, all at once. And we um, are kind of taking it in and then we focus in on one piece of data. So to make this really practical, let's just take an example of, let's just say I'm a manager of a team and um, I have 10 people on my team and we're in a meeting and um, I, I see what's going on in the meeting and um, in the meeting, there's eight of my team members that are really engaged, participating, and two of my team members that aren't. So in one case, I could really focus on the two people that aren't. And I could go, hmm, I wonder what's wrong. I wonder why they're not participating today. And I could add some meaning. You know, it's like, wow, you know, they must not really care about the topic that we're talking about. And I might draw some conclusions about, well, why don't they care about the topic? And they should care about the topic. And you know, this is what it means to be a good employee. They should be participating. And then I adopt some beliefs about them. And then I might take some action, maybe to talk to them or you know, something. But it would be from a place kind of a really quick judgment. Now, as that manager, I could also select data where I've got, wow, I've got eight of my team members really engaged. And I could add some meaning about, yes, and that's great that the majority of people really care about this. And I could also notice those two other people that aren't that engaged. But I could say, hmm, well, I guess maybe I'll check that out later and see what's going on. So you can see how just based on what data you select in this, um, you know, in terms of what's in front of you, it can alter whatever reality you have immensely. And the other thing about this is it happens in a split second. We don't even realize we're adding meaning, drawing conclusions, adopting beliefs. It just happens instantaneously and it forms our reality. And then we think that's what's real, that's what's the truth. But the truth is that there's a lot of different realities that we need to be open to and looking at. And when we're dealing with conflict, we've got to get back to what's actually the data, what are actually the facts. And how can we understand somebody else's reality? <clears throat> so conflict is generally dif difficult because of a multitude of things. One, we get that emotional you know, response, and sometimes we don't know how to navigate that. Um, we get triggered, which is, and we're going to talk about the neuroscience of that, where all of a sudden you go into this reactive place. 
versus a more thoughtful, responsive place. Um, outcomes are uncertain. When we're in conflict, um, this is when I talk with people about why they don't jump into conflict and try to address it more. It's like, well, I don't know if I'm going to make it worse. And so there's just that un fear of the unknown. Um, feels like our self-esteem is at stake. You know, so um, we can start feeling like people don't respect us or we don't belong or, you know, we don't really have a voice or something. Um, and, there, and there's a power differential sometimes, and that can make it really hard if we're trying to um, talk about some conflict that we're having with our boss, where there is, you know, some sort of power differential where that boss has power to make some decisions about our future. Um, we're unclear about what we want. A lot of times um, we're, we're clear on what we don't want, but we often sometimes don't know what we do want. And, um, and so we kind of get locked sometimes into a power struggle about we, what we don't want versus if somebody says, well, what do you really want out of this? It's like, oh, I'm not sure. So, um, so all of these things are going on in the middle of conflict. So the other thing is, We've got, this is a way oversimplification, but it, it helps to make a point. Um, two main conflict styles. One are conflict seekers, and these are people who really like to get conflict on the table. They're just more comfortable if it's on the table, we can talk about it, we can get it resolved. Conflict avoiders are people who are more interested in harmony, and they're more interested in, um, you know, just, well, should we, you know, is this something we should really make a big deal about? And um, there's other, you know, bigger fish to fry or things like that. And both of them are appropriate in some situations. Um, but the key thing here is what I found in from my own experience is when I am working um, with somebody who has an opposite style of me. So let's just say you're a conflict seeker. One of the things, and, and you're working with someone who has a more conflict avoidance, avoidance style. One thing conflict seekers have to be aware of is they have to do a lot to create some psychological safety. So getting the conflict on the table, but with a positive intention around, I'd like to talk to you about this. I think it's going to help both of us. Um, so there's this sense of creating commonality, creating some harmony while talking about the conflict. Um, conflict avoiders have to, um, in order to work better with conflict seekers, need to be able to really step through the discomfort of getting the conflict on the table or um, really talking about the conflict in the moment when the conflict seeker. And one of the things that has helped um, as I've worked with conflict avoiders is they um, to say things like, you know what, it's going to be uncomfortable for about 10 minutes. And then it will start to resolve and it will get better. So I can step into this discomfort for a short time. So, um, so looking at knowing your natural style and knowing that one of the things that helps work through conflict is being aware of who you're working with um, and realizing you might have to adapt your style a bit. <clears throat> Another thing I think that helps with conflict is realizing there's a couple of different types of conflict. One is called cognitive conflict, and this is conflict over ideas. Um, this is generally sometimes what we call creative conflict. It's, um, it can lead to innovation. It can lead to really creative ideas. Um, it's um, really not related to group functioning so much. It's more that kind of excitement you get from debate and really you know, trying to talk through an issue and getting at root cause and things. Affective conflict is where we've moved from a topic or an idea and now it becomes personal. And it is generally negative and it can escalate quickly. And I've seen this many times with groups where um, they're having actually a very healthy cognitive conflict and debating something and all of a sudden somebody says something that challenges somebody's competence. And all of a sudden that person feels, you know, starts to take that personal and then quickly the emotions escalate and the defensiveness and things, um, and, and it turns into that affective conflict. So when we're working with conflict, a lot of it is how do we create this environment where we can actually have this healthy debate? <clears throat> 
So another frame around conflict that I think is helpful to understand is just the neuroscience of conflict. So we're just going to do a quick, quick uh, uh, high-level overview of brain biology. So this is what we call the responsive brain. And um, the, if you start down in the, the lower right-hand quadrant, um, the reptilian brain is our part of our brain that's really looking for safety. And it's the part of our brain that at the height of COVID was going crazy. And, um, and so how, you know, that, how do I create that sense of safety? I'm going to be okay. Um, and then the limbic brain is really about trust and respect and belonging and connection. And um, so it's really looking at, um, you know, where reptilian brain may be more about physical safety, limbic brain is more about psychological safety and do I belong? You know, is it safe to really be me? Is it safe to bring up my point of view? And when that is in place, we get that connection. And then something kind of magical happens where we, um, there's a, actually a gateway that opens up into our higher level thinking, um, which is the neocortex, which is the part of our brain that's really interested in words and patterns and problem solving and, and creating meaning for things. And, um, and then the prefrontal lobes are the part of a, that actually creativity, innovation, forward thinking, visioning. Um, so when everything's working well, um, we, and we feel safe and, you know, we, we're in this responsive brain pattern. Um, but what happens sometimes is things get triggered during conflict where we don't feel safe. And so um, we perceive difference as threats. And, you know, in caveman days, this was really, um, this was a, a real thing. If, you know, there was somebody from a different tribe, they were competing for food with you or whatever, it really was a threat. Our brains are wired to see difference as threat where it really may not be threat. Um, so we're, that's part of the over, um, the, the wiring we're trying to overcome when we work through conflict. And then um, limbic brain, um, which is this part of our brain um, that really wants connection and respect and belonging. If those needs aren't met, then we start to feel isolated. So rather than the gateway opening to the higher levels of thinking and the innovation and creativity, we get kind of a sense of confusion. And then rather getting the, getting the commitment, um, we get apathy. And it looks like some people don't want to cooperate. They don't want to partner with us. But it's just a sign that our reactive brain has been tri tricked or tripped. So, um, so this is part of what we're working with when we look at some of the behaviors we're going to look at in a bit of how do these behaviors, um, how can we use these behaviors to spend more time in that responsive brain versus the reactive brain. So if you think about it for a minute, just, um, just do a reflection. What implications does the brain under threat have for navigating conflict? So kind of simply put, um, it is like when we need our best thinking in order to resolve a conflict, um, oftentimes we are at our lowest level of thinking. And so being able to kind of recognize when we've been triggered and navigate that can really help us. So another lens here to look at is sources of conflict. So one of the things I've learned from my work in organizational development, um, I think this comes out of the quality um, work and, and I believe it was in the 80s and 90s. Um, it's usually about process, not people. So when it looks like it's a people problem, it's usually more about process or something in the situation that if you start to remedy. So things like clarifying goals or clarifying roles. I had two people I worked with once that were in really dire conflict. They couldn't even stand to be in the same room with each other. And um, I interviewed both of them to find out kind of what was going on and then brought them together. And what they, what they realized is they really felt like each thought the other one was going to take over their role because there was some role overlap and that they thought that they were kind of duplicated efforts. And one of them was that they thought one of them was going to be laid off. 
And when we clarified roles, it actually made better efficient use of people and there was no plans to lay them off. Um, and they were able to work together better. They were never best friends, but they could you know, work things out and work together. Um, so looking at, you know, sometimes processes and handoffs when things get dropped and then they starts to, you know, blame people versus saying, wait a minute, we really need to clarify the process here. Um, personality and work style differences. I mean, this is so many things that, um, assessments that we've done in the workplace of just in my experience and insights and, um, different things that help us see, oh, people work differently. And when I can accept those differences, I can find a way to work with those better. Um, our perception differences, we just see things differently. And back to that different reality piece. Um, value differences. Um, I, I've seen some of the most intense conflict over value differences. And we would not hold our values if we didn't think they were right. And so when those values get challenged, um, sometimes there's just like a lot of intensity. And the question is, can we really respect that we might have some value differences or cultural differences and yet still work toward a common goal? Um, and, and resources, you know, just lack of resources. And um, there are, you know, other things that may, be, these are some of the common ones that I have encountered. So another lens here around understanding conflict is stages of conflict. So the first level, and in some ways this really isn't even a level of conflict, it's differences. We have a difference of opinion. And, um, and so sometimes those differences, they just are, that's what they are, and they're actually great. And we actually need to leverage them and work with them. Um, and there's really nothing to be done with them except respect them and acknowledge them and, and leverage. Um, and the second one here is a misunderstanding. So it's where we might have a perception difference. Um, you might have some information that um, different than I have. Um, it might be about a change coming down the pike, and I have an a, a understanding that somehow my, my role is going to change dramatically, and, and I don't want that, and so now I'm in conflict with the change. But when I actually get actual, actual information and find out, oh, it's not going to change that much, and the part that is going to change, I'll actually get support for, then you know it, it kind of gets that cleared up. Now, the third level is where it's like we have an actual disagreement. What you want, you know, you want something and I want something and it is in disagreement. Um, and so this is where really good listening skills, understanding what is you want, what is I want. Um, I'll give you an example here. I worked um, uh, with a new client once I had been working with part of the organization in this, um, and, um, and there was a new boss that came in and I was going to kick off a big training program for them after, um, in, in the fall. And um, about a, a week before um, Labor Day, um, this new boss came in and she said, I wanna see the complete design, training design um, before um, the Labor Day weekend. Um, because I want to review it and whatever. Well, I had planned a vacation during that time, and um, it was kind of a renegotiation of the of the deadline. And um, and so we were in conflict because I wanted to go on my vacation, and she wanted this this training design early. So when I um, probed a little deeper in terms of what was really going on. Um, what I realized was she didn't have any history with me. The people, the rest of the people in the organization did, but she was nervous about quality and, you know, was it really going to be delivered, you know, in the quality that she wanted. And so I talked through some of that with her to make sure I understood her requirements. And then I said, would it help you, help you if I sent you another kind of training class I've done so you can see kind of the quality of work? And she goes, oh, yeah, that would be great. And so through that discussion and talking about that, I was able to negotiate so that I could get a, an extra week um, and I could still go on my vacation. Um, so there's ways of getting 
it, when you get into the heart of it, if you start to really look at what's going on, that there's ways that both people can get their needs met. Now, in stage four, um, when that hasn't happened and you haven't done a great job of listening and understanding, um, is we kind of call this going into active discord. And now there's a huge emotional charge with the um, conflict. And um, and there, this is where you might recognize like drama and stories and things start flying about this group or that group or this person or that person. And we've kind of lost sight of what the actual outcome is. Um, and, and so that makes it you know, really hard to kind of come back and go, wait a minute, what are we really trying to accomplish? What are we really trying to do here? And then the fifth stage is polarization which is what we're seeing um, you know, in our political scene where all of a sudden we've lost sight of, of, the, of the other as a, as a person or a legitimate group and we've just almost demonized the, the other side. And a lot of us versus them you know, things are going on. So um, the work spent to really honor differences, clear up mis misunderstandings, and really explore disagreement can do a huge um, you know, benefit for avoiding these higher stages of conflict, which are much harder to resolve. <clears throat> so this is kind of a paradox quote. It says, to practice the process of conflict re resolution, we must completely abandon the goal of getting people to do what we want. So, you know, I teach um, some classes on power and influence. And one of the things I've realized with influence, and it's true with conflict resolution as well, is if we don't um, start from a place of um, trying to manipulate people, a lot of times we say we're influencing people when we're really just trying to manipulate them, versus saying, what is it that is, you know, maybe that I don't know what is best in terms of an outcome here. And if I can show up um, and have some good constructive behaviors in terms of working through this conflict, um, maybe we both can get what we want. And maybe I don't even understand what it is the other person wants um, completely. So um, behaviors that help and hinder. So conflict, um, these are uh, from this research. And this is. Um, actually an assessment you can take. And I put the, the website down here, um, conflictdynamics.org. Um, and it's the conflict dynamics profile. And it measures seven constructive behaviors and eight destructive behaviors. So um, I'll go through the constructive active behaviors. So perspective taking. This is the ability to see things from another perspective. It's the ability to say, hmm, I might not be able to, I might not be seeing the whole picture here. I might have some missing information. And I'm willing to put aside how I'm seeing it for a moment to really understand how someone else is seeing it. Um, I had a boss once who um, we had a very good relationship and um, but he, um, I went into him one day and I was frustrated because another department wasn't doing something or whatever. And on the whiteboard, he took a, a marker and drew a big circle. He said, Stephanie, here's the universe. And then he put a dot um, in the center of it. And he said, here's the center of the universe. And then he pointed at the dot and he said, you are not here. And I was like, what? <laughs> Um, but it's like perspective taking is realizing we are not center of the universe, that there's a lot of other perspectives here that we need to understand. Um, and so being able to listen well and create an environment where we really can um, be open to learning something new. Um, creating solutions. So what they found in the research was people who rather than getting stuck on the conflict and arguing, moved it forward to saying, okay, what can we do about this? What possibilities could we come up with that would work for both of us? The quicker that happened, the more positive kind of cooperative energy was happening. Um, expressing emotion, which is very interesting because um, 
sometimes we think emotions should be kind of left out of the workplace, um, but they found that expressing authentic emotion, like, I'm really worried that if we don't get this resolved, we're going to miss the deadline. Or when I see this happening in our meetings, it concerns me because it feels like we're getting off target from what we're trying to accomplish. So being able to just express emotion and in a vulnerable way, and it's that vulnerability that starts to open up a more authentic, real dialogue. Um, reaching out. So reaching out is the idea that once a, con a conflict has happened, um, say in a meeting, that um, you might go back to the person and say, you know, I just didn't really like how we ended the meeting. And I'm wondering if you'd be, be willing to talk it through it some more. Um, so it's the, the idea that you, you know, you don't have to, um, you know, it's not just you've made a mistake forever and you can never, you know, recover. So it's the, uh, the ability that you can reach out, you can say, you know, can we try this again? So I, I had an experience once with a client where I had given them some dates and, um, and all of a sudden, about an hour later, I realized that those dates weren't good dates and I called them back and I was, um, I said, you know, I'm going to need to change those dates. And she said, well, I'm really, you know, I've already got the CEO and he's going to come and do, 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 do And she was really upset. And I said, you know, normally I could change these dates, but they were actually published in the catalog and there, there was nothing that I could do about it. And, and she said, well, fine. And she hung up and she goes, I'll change it. And I thought, well, this isn't a great thing to start out with a new client. And so I did some perspective taking and I thought, okay, so what might she be feeling? And that, well, she's probably feeling like she hired some flake of a consultant and, um, and you know, what could I do to kind of reassure her? And so I, I reached back out knowing I couldn't change the dates, but, you know, I just said, hey, I, I'm really sorry this happened. I said, I, you know, I've been in business for, for 20 years. This, you know, has only happened one other time. I really apologize. And, um, and, uh, and here's what I can, here's what I can do. And, um, and she said, um, you know, I really appreciate you reaching out and telling me I was able to make the change and everything's fine. And, and I just appreciate you reaching out. So, um, and the other thing about reaching out is um, sometimes it's like after we've been kind of triggered in our reptilian brain, things are calmer and we can kind of work things out um, more effectively. So passive constructive behaviors. Um, this is reflective thinking. So this is the idea of thinking through the root cause, like what's really going on here? What might be the stage of, of conflict we're in? Are we, do we have a misunderstanding? Do we have an active disagreement? Is this just a difference? Um, and what is it that we might need to actually, in terms of ground rules, so that we can spend more time having that cognitive conflict, creative conflict, versus you know the the affective personal conflict? Um, so it's doing some reflective thinking about the outcome and what's the best way to move forward. And then um, the. Uh, delay responding is kind of that three to five seconds where um, it is that moment where you want to react and you want to go, yeah, but, or you want to state your point or you want to argue or you want to, you know, it's just taking a breath and relaxing. And they say the more, and it, you know, if you think of that moment when you want to respond to that email and just whip it off, it's like that three to five seconds where it's where that reactive brain gets tripped. If you can just pause and breathe, you give a chance for your responsive brain to come back on track. And then adapting is really saying, okay, you know what? We've come up with some ideas here. This isn't exactly how I thought it was gonna go, but I think this will meet my needs. And so it's being willing to, you know, to bend a little bit, but not, not necessarily compromise where you feel like you're giving something up, it's just like you're adapting to a different way of getting what you wanted that you didn't see. Um, so that's constructive. Um, destructive is winning at all costs. So I don't know, this is the getting into the arguments and right and wrong and you know trying to persuade people and, and displaying anger, which I just said expressing emotion was, was constructive, 
But displaying anger is acting out anger, slamming doors, yelling, pounding fists, um, you know, that kind of thing, which, which creates a lot of fear and threat, threat and trips that reptilian brain. Um, demeaning others. Um, this is sarcasm or um, eye rolling. I actually took a 360 in, on this and I had gotten some feedback that I was higher in demeaning others than I thought I was. And I was talking to my husband about it and I said, I don't demean others, do I? And we looked at the definition. He goes, no, you're not sarcastic. And then he goes, oh yeah, but you roll your eyes all the time when you get back in the corner. Kind of just like that disgust. Um, retaliating, wanting to get back. Um, avoiding, this is just like not wanting to talk about it at all. Um, just, you know, ignoring, withdrawing. Um, yielding um, is that, that sense of like, well, fine, I'll just do it then. But there's this undercurrent of resentment. Um, hiding emotions where you really aren't authentically expressing what's going on. And oftentimes we think we're hiding emotions when we're not. It's actually very apparent to other people and it kind of comes out sideways. And then self-criticizing is really looking at um, kind of once you interact with a conflict or and it doesn't, you know, something happens, then you go, oh, I should have said that. Oh, I didn't have said that. Oh, and you just loop on it and you can't let go of that loop. And that's destructive because, of course, it's it's hard on you, but it's also that energy is being put internal versus external to try to resolve the conflict. So um, just thinking about, you know, which ones of these do you think you're really good at that come naturally? Um, which ones might you want to do more of on the constructive side? And which ones might you want to do less of on the destructive side to play around with? And even if you just took one of these to say, I'm going to try this a little bit more, I'm going to try this a little bit less, it, my, my hunch is it would have a huge impact. <clears throat> okay, so another thing here, I'm just going to go through this quickly. Um, also on the Conflict Dynamics website, there's a, a hot buttons test you can take. And a hot button is people or situations that irritate you enough to provoke con conflict. So, um, and, and those more destructive um, responses. So these are the nine hot buttons that they found in their research. And you'll find that some of these you might go, oh, aloof people really don't bother me that much, but oh my gosh, unreliable people or overly analytical people. Um, and what the reason hot buttons are problematic is because it gets that reptilian brain tripped. Um, and then we go into more of that reactive brain versus responsive. Um, so if you're interested, I won't go into this just because of time, but feel free to explore this a little bit more on your own. Um, just cooling strategies. Um, some of these are um, helpful to skip back in that responsive brain. Um, the one I really like is ask someone else for perspective, especially someone you trust, not somebody who's going <clears> to <throat> like, reinforce you know your point of view necessarily but is really going to give you an authentic real perspective all right so the last piece here um, we're going to look at is um, three core conflict skills and these are not rocket science but they're um, important skills to keep in mind when we're dealing with conflict um, in the in the heat of conflict so listening creative questioning and identifying or clarifying outcomes. So listening, listening literally means to pay attention to, which is hard sometimes when we're easily distracted by so many different things. It takes awareness off of us, puts it on to other people. So back to that, I'm not the center of the universe. I'm going to really say, what is this person's world like? Listen for that. Um, it takes a lot of physical, emotional energy. That's why sometimes we don't do it. Um, it's not the same, not talking is not the same as listening. Um, it is that ability to, listening is really the ability to say, I am willing to be changed by something I hear. Then you know you're really in a listening mindset. <clears throat> so some door openers for listening. There's two key skills around listening. Tell me more um, is one of my favorite phrases, especially when I get triggered by something somebody says. And I want to respond with my yabats or defend myself or something. Um, 
it was, you know, say more about that. Tell me more. And then being able to listen to that and then using summarizing skills. Summarizing skills, the research would show it takes us out of our reptilian limbic brain more into those um, kind of neocortex um, higher levels of thinking. Um, so by summarizing, people feel heard, they feel respected, they feel like they belong, um, they really care, they feel like you are caring about their point of view. And sometimes this is really hard when it's when you're summarizing someone's point of view that you might disagree with. And just because you're you're listening or summarizing doesn't necessarily mean you have to agree with it, but you do have to try to understand it in, in terms of conflict and if we really want to help resolve conflict. Um, creative questioning. So this is the idea of really getting curious about what's going on. Um, there's two kinds of questions here. Um, directive questions are more closed-ended, um, and they're very appropriate at some times to create closure, gather facts, information. Creative question is there's no right answer. It makes you think about things more um, deeply and see things from different points of view. So here are some just examples um, in terms of you know, creative questions around what are you worried about? Um, how do you think other people might see this? Trying to invite that new perspective. What are we assuming that may not be true? Um, my favorite one here is short-term experiment could help us both. I love the idea of experimenting with solutions to just short-term see what we can gather in terms of data and come back together. Um, so it, these kind of questions tend to open up the possibilities. <clears throat> Identifying outcomes is the third one. Um, so an outcome is kind of the result of a process or an activity. Um, interests are what we call, it's kind of what is it that we really want or need. And oftentimes our interests are in conflict, but our outcomes are not. So for example, um, my outcome might be, I want to complete my project on time. My interest is, I want more resources for my project. Now, we might be in conflict about those resources. Um, and you might, like, let's say we, we both want Andre for our project team. And, and so we're in conflict, you know, over that resource. But if we both say, okay, we both want to complete our project on time, um, what are creative ways that we could look at, you know, working this through so that we could both complete our projects on time? We might come up with very different ways about how to use resources differently than we have. Um, what kinds of timelines could be pushed out or worked or whatever? Um, but it takes some really authentic, real, open dialogue. <clears throat> and then just some principles of effective conflict resolution. Um, I, I find of all of the ones listed here, the one, um, I, I guess I would say two, um, state intention for both sides to win. Um, so whenever I'm going into a conflict situation, to be able to say, um, you know, my intention or my desire is that we both get what we need here. Because that re relaxes that reptilian brain and we go from a place of scarcity to a place of creativity. Like, let's see if we can figure this out. And then to really listen to what's going on for the other person and the difficulties and challenges that they're, um, they're, they're facing. And then um, the last one here is, um, I, you know, I've taught conflict resolution um, for many years and We've got all these great conflict principles and this and that, um, but in order to work through conflict, you actually have to have a willing partner. So sometimes there isn't willingness there. And then sometimes you do have to just compromise. Sometimes you do have to avoid. The best way to just deal with the situation is to avoid it. Sometimes you have to alter your perspective and alter your way of looking at it. Um, sometimes you just have to accept what is, and sometimes you might need to force compliance, you know, if there is a, a, a power, you know, if you have, actually have the power to do that. Um, so this, you know, 
the things we've talked about today isn't just a panacea and cure-all for every situation, but hopefully you found some things that um, would, will help you navigate um, conflict when you run into it again. So with that, I will stop and um, take some questions. Yes, thank you so much, Stephanie, for presenting today on this topic. I know I certainly learned some better ways to um, use those cooling strategies because I know I've been in situations where maybe I reacted a little <laughs> bit quickly. So, <laughs> so yes, um, we will move on to questions now. So if folks have any questions, please use the Q&A forum and I'll pass those over to Stephanie. Um, apologize in advance if I don't get to your questions. Um, so we'll start here with one. Uh, one of our listeners asks, I think I am a conflict avoider and thus I want to get conflict resolved quickly. How should I handle a person that might be a conflict seeker and wants the conflict to continue on and on and on? <laughs> well, I, I will say it, um, sometimes as a conflict avoider, it does feel like they want to continue on and on and that may not be the case. Um, but sometimes people really do like the drama. I mean, there is that aspect. So part of it of, um, of, of dealing with a conflict seeker is um, actually thanking them for getting it on the table because um, that's something that's hard for conflict avoiders to do. So the conflict seeker, seeker actually got it on the table. Um, but also sometimes you can um, say, I really want to resolve this because it's uncomfortable for me. Um, I'm seeing that we tend to rehash the same issue over and over again. And what I would like to do is really clarify what it is, you know, what's the outcome you want? Here's what I want. What's, what are one or two things we could try to move forward constructively? So to really get out of the drama of the conflict and move forward in terms of the outcome um, and, and also um, doing some active listening and saying, I, I would I want to make sure I understand your concern because sometimes people keep going on and on because they don't think you understand them. Mm -hmm. So by using the active listening and summarizing and saying, let me just see if I've got the heart of it for you is you're frustrated because of this and this and this, is that right? And if it's true, they'll go, yeah, that's right. And they might go, yeah, and, um, but, you know, at some point, if they keep going, yeah, and, 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 you might say, okay, well, I think we've got enough out. Can we move on now to the next phase? Okay. Yes. Thank you. Okay. So the next one is, what tools would you suggest for managers that have difficulty with conflict to encourage them to have conversation stuff that need to correct their behavior? Yeah. So um, I think, um, you know, there's so many good tools out there around difficult conversations. Um, crucial conversations is, a, is one um, that's been out there for quite a while that's really helpful. Um, there's another book called Fierce Conversations. I think it's by Susan Scott. Um, that's very good. Um, and I think part of it is getting a, uh, the process down. And um, there are also, um, you know, good classes in terms of just basic performance management discussions. How do you have a, a, a performance management discussion in terms of clarifying you know, expectations, giving feedback, and then working through those um, you know, difficult, more difficult performance issues? I also say contact your human resource people if you have them. They, they are a great, great help with that. Awesome. Okay, so the next one is a conflict can switch between cognitive and affective so quickly. Mm -hmm. I would love ideas to tactfully, gently, and sen sensitively refocus discussion back to cognitive quickly. Yeah, good. So we're really true. And so sometimes just being able to say, you know what, it feels like this is the conversations turned personal. Um, I'd like to refocus the conversation on what's the outcome we're really trying to achieve and what's the decision we're really trying to make here. Um, and so, so sometimes just calling it out without, without judgment, you're not blaming anybody. It's like, it just, boy, we took a turn here. Um, can we refocus on what we're really trying to accomplish here? Okay, great. Let's see. All right. So I've heard lately, you don't have to show up to every conflict you're invited to. How do you engage <laughs> this advice without being a conflict avoider? 
<laughs> I love it. Yes, um, I do think it's um, realizing what is conflict and what is drama. So drama is, you know, things that just spin and don't ever get resolved. And those are things you don't want to show up to. Um, and just, you know, re refocusing of saying, you know what, I I've got things I need to accomplish or focus on or do or and have good boundaries around that. Um, and if it is a conflict that you really, um, sometimes you might be more of a, not a main player in the conflict. Um, and so sometimes you might ask for role clarification in terms of what is it, you know, would you, would you like my, you know, input into this and why, what role would you like me to play? Um, can sometimes uh, help that as well. Okay. Um, so our next question is, can you speak to the connection between client and customer partner management and navigating conflict? How do you keep the client customer partner happy while directly addressing the conflict? Mm. <laughs> I think we need a whole course on that. <laughs> you know, I think it's like keep, keeping this balance between what the customer needs are and the organization's needs because you know, they used to have this thing that said the customer is always right, but if the customer is always right and it affects the organization negatively enough that they're not even in business to support the customer, then that doesn't work out. So I think it's getting authentically what the needs of both the organization and the customer are uh, um, and having that authentic dialogue and saying, what can we do so that we both get what we need here? Okay. Awesome. Um, so this listener has two questions. Um, I grew up in a conflict averse, passive aggressive family. I struggle with feeling triggered around conflict and tend to cry. What can I do to move out of being triggered to conflict resolution? And the second question is, how can you navigate conflict with someone who is mistreating others in the workplace? Mm -hmm. so yeah, so I, I, that that um, kind of cry trigger often is when you've had a bad experience with conflict in the past, it feels so threatening. Um, it kind of taps that that inner you know child part of us that feels like. So part of it is really real re helping yourself realize your own boundaries and your own safety in any situation and um, really exploring how do I set good boundaries so that I am um, feeling safe in terms of like even saying things like, you know what, I, I'd be glad to talk about this. I want some time to think about it. So if you find yourself getting triggered into crying and just say, I, I need a break. I really do want to work through this. Can we come back and do it later? That's setting a healthy boundary that kind of protects yourself and actually gives you time to, you know, work through what you need to work through. Awesome. Thank you for that. Um, so what tips and advice do you have for navigating conflicts in more of a virtual realm and remote work? Hmm. Well, I think in any case with conflict, you've got to create some good psychological safety. And, um, and so I think it just, you know, anything you can find around how do you create psychological safety is the same virtually as it is, um, you know, um, and, and, and sometimes it actually you can create actually a more um, intimate connection, even virtually, um, in a weird sort of way, which is what I found. So um, I think just looking for more information really on creating psychological safety. <laughs> All right. Yeah. So I am going to finish up with those questions then. Um, so if you can go to the last slide of the presentation. All right. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, we will send a link to the webinar recording within a week of today's webinar. If you enjoyed this webinar and want to dive deeper into this topic, there is a list of upcoming courses on the slide, as well as the college contact information if you'd like to learn more information. So thank you again, Stephanie, and thank you everyone for joining us and all have a wonderful and safe afternoon. Thank you.